The devil is in the details. And the details show one thing. Every single coach that comes into Berea is the same. They're all looking to be king. They all heard of the storied franchise. They all heard of the magic that will happen and how great they'll be loved and adored if you turn one of the greatest franchises beyond from, from the back in the day. And that's why they all come and they all flame out eventually because it's only so long you can pretend. This is going to be a very important blog for every Browns fans out there to take a look at. From time to time, I like to give you these real talk conversations and have you dig a little deeper into um, the themes and some of the narratives that go in, inside of, of football and professional athletics. You know, when you're a Cleveland Browns fan and you go through so many roller coaster rides and, um, you know, the seasons of, of losing and finding new ways to lose. And, you know, for the first five games of the season, it just seems like the Browns, it, it's either special teams or it's running the football or teams just gashing us and missed assignments, missed tackles, um, you know, terrible pursuit angles, uh, just passive play in general, no life, just absence of any passion on the field. You know, for, for a lot of people, for Browns fans, you say, why does this always continues to happen to us? Why does this always continue to happen um, to, to us as a fan base? And we are so loyal and we, so, we commit so much of our time, energy and resources, our money, our energy uh, to the Cleveland Browns. And yet we, we seem to never get anything back in return. And I wanted to create this video and do this video because I think there's a psychological thing that goes on. And this is intentional. It's not the fans. It, it's it's the organization and it's the coaches, right? And it's the general managers. And I believe that I could show in this video over the last 20 years, I believe that people in professional athletics have found a way, just like most of our political uh, you know, pundits and, and the guys who we put in office, whether that would be on any side of the aisle, uh, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, whatever the case may be. I argue that in politics, it's a game, right? They play this little game back and forth where, you know, it's, it's the oldest trope, trope in the world. It's good versus evil, rich versus poor. It's all these different things. Um, but when you cut it back and you peel back the onion, you, re you realize um, that it's nothing much more than to stay in the power. You know, one side gets in office, and they consistently do what they want. The other side fights like hell to say, look at this. We're turning to socialism or communism or, or whatever. Uh, you know, this is fascism. And then the other side gets in office. They do what they want. And the other side takes turns saying back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so you don't realize that the only thing that they really have in common is they've been in politics for 40 years. You have career politicians who do nothing but politic they do nothing but uh argue back and forth for 40 or 50 years with no term limits so if, if the president of the united states can and the, he's the most powerful person on the face of the earth if he has an eight-year term limit why would the people in congress who make the laws why would they not have terms then you go to the judicial branch i mean the supreme court those are lifetime appointments i, I always ask you why do why is it lifetime? Like you just get on there forever? You see, you start really questioning those different things. And it's not a this is not a political blog. I'm gonna get to football and sports, but I need to line up some some parallels to give you guys so you guys can understand certain things. For the longest time, they told people like me that you can't talk about politics, that you can't talk about things of that nature because people just don't want to hear it. Well, I came into the game and I said, it's not the fact that they don't want you to hear it. It's the fact that they don't want you to be educated. It's the fact that they don't want you to learn about what's going on so they can stay in office forever. That's the reason they don't want to want you to talk about it. Nothing is that divisive about whether or not, you know, politics are so divisive. Really? Do you vote for roads or you don't want no new roads? Do you want some clean drinking water? Do you not? And if you really both agree, how are we paying for it, right? So you debate back and forth, how are you going to pay for it? Nothing is that divisive. It's just a simple fact that they give you that so that you can chew on that 
and you can argue back and forth about the rules of engagement why they just sit there and continue to do what they want. Now, the parallel is with coaches. And coaches have now figured out a way, too. So if you look at it, coaching is a fraternity, so to speak. Um, people always ask me, would you ever coach? And I said, no. And the reason I, I, would, I would never coach is because there's coaches that don't want to win. The goal is not to win football games. Um, the goal is to stay in the game as long as possible, to be able to make a living and to stay in the game and stay in power, so to speak. So if you're in the game and you're talking to, and you're, you're an assistant and you know your coach is running the worst playbook of, uh, in the world, or you're questioning his down and distances, or you're going ab about thinking about why he's doing certain things, you can never question your coach because you know that the NFL stands for not for long. Coaches' lives are miserable. You get fired over here, you go to D Division II school. Then you then go from a Division II coordinator back up to Army. After you leave Army, you go to Arizona State. You have Arizona State as a tight end coach. Then you become a film guy and, and a DB coach for the, for the Buffalo Bills. Then, you, then you, you're up for a coordinating position. You take a coordinating position at Alabama. It just, it all, it just keeps going. So you're always in practice. And the way you get to keep and stay in power is by not rocking the boat. Because you are going to demand total loyalty and fealty if you ever become a head coach or if you become a coordinator. Because you know what the game is. The game is, I'm going to give you a job, but you're going to do what I say do. And sometimes doing what a head coach say or a defensive coordinator say is totally counterproductive and, and, and at the total end of the spectrum when it comes to winning football games. They, they have this thing where they're going to appeal to your calmness. They're going to appeal to, the, to your, to your smarter side, get, appeal to your reasoning. Guys, we can't keep turning it over every year. Guys, the reason we're not winning is because no continuity. You guys are knee-jerk reactions. You got to let it simmer. Let a guy get his program off and didn't really evaluate it. Now, to most people, that would sound like a, a sound thing to do. It would seem like you're being an adult and being rational about the situation. But in reality, you just fall and pray to what they've been doing for the last 30 years. And it's, and it's always evident because Kevin Stefanski says this. Uh. We didn't do enough as a team. We didn't do enough as coaches. Uh, are the guys playing hard? Of course. Yeah, uh, not questioning that at all. Um, and, and Jacoby's making plays. Um, but it's uh, we're, uh, we got to clean things up. If you want to get a win in the NFL, um, you can't do some of the things we did. But how is that different from any other coaches? Let's see if you can pick out the difference between them, what they're saying. Well, this is uh, this is uh, the, the previous coach. This is uh, Freddie Kitchens. We didn't do a good enough job of matching that intensity. Started the game off well offensively and defensively and didn't maintain it through the second half. Striking, isn't it? One guy's an Ivy Leaguer. One guy's a down-home good old boy, and he just, you know, love football. But the message, the tone, what he's saying is all the same. Thought that was bad. Let's go back and take a look at the guy that took over before him. Not only any anything that went down wrong today, I totally take responsibility for it. It doesn't matter. It's on me. So it doesn't, no need to go into it. I got to do a better job with the offensive unit. Just that simple. It's on me. That's what I'm saying. I'm mad at myself. So nobody else. Period. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. It's on me. It's, I mean, to go round and round about it, I'm not going to do that. Anything that happens with our offensive football team is my responsibility. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Well, hey, I'm taking a fall on everything. Tough nose, Mike Patton. But overall, I mean, we're going to have to regroup from this one quickly, and and um, you know, put it behind us, and we're 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 on to the next one. But you know, in all in all three phases, it was a, it was a tough day. Tough, hard nose ball player. But you notice he ain't saying a bunch of nothing in the press conferences either. He got up there and said a bunch of nothing. When things aren't going well and you have losses like this, it's it's uh, you know the the questions come up. You just have to make sure as you question everything that you you realize these are the things. This is our core. This is what we're doing well. These are areas we need to improve. You don't you don't want to you know if you 
that you've got something wrong with your heart. You don't want to operate on the brain. It's not the first tough nose guy in the building. Guy before him, a couple guys before him, Eric Mangini. This guy is uh, finding people for water bottles, finding them tough. You're going to get on a bus. And you're going to go talk to people that, that we're going to do a kid's camp. We're going to get every, uh, nine, 90 grown men on a butt. And every press conference, you sit up there saying a bunch of nothing. This is a group that works hard, that executes game plan. When you have a turnover that goes for a touchdown and you have another turnover that sets up three points, 10-point swing in a, in a game that's decided by a very small margin. And um, there are nine penalties, too many, too many penalties. I could keep going, but the reality is that is intentional. It's intentional. See, they've, they've mastered the, op the, the, the ability to say a bunch of nothing and actually do it in a way where you might think you're actually getting something. That you, wow, look how, look how pro professional he is. And one of the things that you talk about with this, and one of the things that you get with this whole process is, well, I accept this responsibility. That's on me. I'll take responsibility for that. We're going to get this fixed. It's unacceptable. It's not about the effort of the group today. It's just like the mistakes. That's not nothing new to, to just, to, that's not nothing original by Kevin Stefanski. We just didn't, we didn't execute it well. I got to give him a better play and then uh, we got to make it. Now you got Pat Shermer saying the same thing. Rod Chazinski saying the same thing. You still got Hugh Jackson and a bunch of other dudes saying the same doggone stuff. Pat Shermer, same old doggone stuff. And you ask yourself, is that a coincidence? No. When you accept responsibility for something, responsibility de de denotes that that is something you can control. If I'm responsible for turning my homework in, if I'm responsible for turning my homework in, that means that I can only turn my homework in. My mom can't turn it in. No one else can do it. It's up to me. Responsibility is an individual thing. Accountable means there's some level of authority over you that will have actions if you don't do X, Y, and Z. Notice a lot of these guys talk about responsibility, but never accountability. That is the thing that really hits home when you listen to this. Because what they're doing actually is they're using a linguistic technique in order to deflect by accepting responsibility. Say for instance, you have a kid, right? You know, he does something bad. When you go to interrogate him and say, what happened? Tell me the truth, what happened? He immediately, before you can even get it out, just says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You'd be like, but hold on, you sorry for what? You haven't even heard what I'm mad at you about. Well, whatever it is, I'm sorry. He's just saying sorry just to get it out the way. He's just basically saying, hey, I'm sorry. Shut up. Leave me alone. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. It's on me. It's, I mean, to go round and round about it, I'm not going to do that. Anything that happens with our offensive football team is my responsibility. Whatever you got to say, I'm sorry for. Let's just skip the pleasantries. Let's just skip all the when, where, why, wins, what's, and where's. Let's just skip that and get right to what we're going to get down to. It's on me. That's what I'm saying. Mad myself. So nobody else. Period. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. It's on me. It's, I mean, to go round and round about it, I'm not going to do that. Anything that happens with our offensive football team is my responsibility. It doesn't matter. doesn't matter. Well, hey, I'm taking a fall on everything. And this is the same thing that coaches do. When you ask them questions about why can't you stop the run? Why can't you, 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 uh, why couldn't you give me any pressure on the quarterback? Why do you have these mis 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 mistakes? Why do you have these things going on consistently throughout your organization? Instead of them d reflecting on it, actually thinking about some things and being self-reflective and then saying, okay, let me go dig through this and figure out what the problem is. And then I could get you an answer. These coaches have just blanketly just started saying, yeah, it's my fault. Put that on me. This is my fault. It's on me. Matter of fact, this guy is a, it was the king of doing it. So when you are actually accepting your the responsibility without examining any self-awareness, you're, acti you're actively using a deflection technique. Stakes were 
clearly made. Serious mistakes were made in trying to do so. I don't want to sound like I made no mistakes. I'm confident I have. Because at the end of the day, it's not about responsibility. It's accountability. We want to know why it happened, give an account why it happened, and how you're going to go about fixing what happened. Mistakes are made by everyone. But why do we make the same mistakes over and over again? I lose my cell phone. I drop my phone everywhere. I procrastinate. Spending money. Okay. On stupid things. Rushing through things. Just constantly late. I date the same assholes over and over again. Oh no! <laughs> the question when somebody says, hey coach, you guys can't stop the run. What was it about? The answer isn't, well, you know, I, I you know, I looked at the tape. We just weren't good enough up front. Um, we, we just weren't good. We got we to gotta clean some stuff up. Being aware of how we've messed up in the past doesn't really seem to help. Our brains don't learn from our past mistakes as much as we might hope. Take, for example, one study that had people look at their past spending before going shopping. Remembering their past mistake, overspending, didn't keep them from doing it all over again. No, 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 no. Drill down on that. So, how do we stop this vicious cycle? I could have gone for the nice guy, but he didn't have as much swag and he wasn't as cool, right? Right, right. I have all the answers. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just putting those answers into practice. Have you ever tried to spend less money? No. <laughs> no, no, coach, I didn't mean higher level. I, I, I meant your defensive tackles are getting blown off the football. Uh, you're losing gap contain you are busting coverages why did they bust the coverage was it the fact that the signal got in late was it the fact that somebody just had a brain fart was it the fact that somebody was doing their own thing and thought they were going to make a play what was it and how did you systematically go about correcting that in practice the problem is your brain wastes so much time trying to figure out what happened did something about the world change is there something wrong with me that it distracts you from finding the right answer uh, how many phones have you gone through? Three on phones. Oh, oh my gosh. Like, where do you usually find it once you find it? Kitchen counter. Almost always on the kitchen counter. Never where I look first, but it's always right behind it. Do you play the piano and you miss a note and if you're in public, it makes, it's a grand mess. I can practice and practice and practice and it's just like, I go and I freeze. That's what we want to know. They don't care about that. Because if they did, we wouldn't have a succession of all of these people that I keep showing here. And we started the game great, you know, and we can carried it on with the op uh, opportunities that we had through the first half, all right? And then the second half, they kind of took over the game and we didn't match it. And that, then the opportunities had presented themselves for us to take control of the game and we didn't do it for whatever reason, offensively, defensively, or special teams. Sounding like here. We just didn't get it. I can't tell you exactly. I know exactly why. There was a couple situations getting the right people in the game, getting the play to the quarterback in a timely fashion, and then him calling it properly. No difference from here. We played, uh, whether it's a half, whether it's a quarter, whether it's uh, a couple series or three quarters of games, we've played uh, very well at times. And it's a matter of consistently putting it together for four quarters, and you know, that's what the, the mission is that, that we're on right now. Same tone is here. The fourth quarter's been your toughest for, for your unit. <laughs> uh, what, what's different that you're seeing on film between the first three quarters and, and, and that final quarter? You know, it's, it's tough. You just, you know, for us, and I, I do the same thing. I know I say the same thing to you guys every week, but I always go after the game, we do the evaluation, um, address our goals, talk about what we did well, areas that we need to improve. And it's going to happen every game. You know, it's the NFL, there's going to be problems. Lack of accountability here. Um, but for us with that game, like we made adjustments at halftime and we got off the field, I think 12 plays, the first three series with a turnover. So you're, you're feeling, feeling great about the adjustments you made. Then we got in the fourth quarter and it's, you know, it's just like when the Jets, they came out and they said, we're just chipping everybody and just all the time. Then these guys just said, hey, we're going to run the ball. So I don't know if our adjustments made them do that, but they just said, hey, we're going to run it, run it, run it. And um, they had success and moved the ball down the field. 
So I, I don't know what it is, probably a little bit of everything. And this is a long answer. It's probably a little bit of everything. Um, but we're just going to continue to address what we're trying to do defensively and, and do it cleanly. If you didn't have all, if it wasn't, if it wasn't purposeful, it wouldn't continue to happen because any smart person would learn from other people's mistakes. A bear, a wolf, and a fox each catch a deer. The bear turns to the wolf and says, how should we divide up the deer? The wolf said, I think we should each keep the deer we caught. Before the wolf could say another word, the bear ate him. The bear then turned to the fox and said, how should we divide up the deer? The fox turned to the bear and said, I think you should have my deer and take the wolf's deer as well. The bear exclaimed, how did you get such wisdom? The fox said, from the wolf. It was Groucho Marx who said, learn from the mistakes of others. You can never live long enough to make them all yourself. Actually, I've been doing some reflected on this. And I've reflected just as long as you guys have. I don't got all the answers. But I will tell you this. The answer to me, and it dawned on me, comes from old literature and old tales. We've all heard about King Arthur and Merlin. And we've all heard about the, you know, Excalibur in a rock. Excalibur in, on a stone somewhere, right? We all know the fairy tale. We all know the great, you know, one of those great old fairy tales and stories, right? So, you know, I'm a fantasy guy, and I went back to look at it, and I, it just dawned on me that there's a lot of parallels in, in that, that fable. There's a lot of parallels that you can take and, and, and apply to real life. And one of the things that caught me was the reason why the Cleveland Browns consistently have coaches doing the same thing over and over and over again and not really learning. It's because they're trying to, trying to fulfill some sort of prophecy of destiny. He said, oh, God, G. Bush, what are you talking about here? You got to have to tie this together. You're going to have to do something here. You, you, want, you lost me. Britain became desperate for a new ruler, a ruler which fate aptly supplied with a little help from a wizard named Merlin. So everyone knows Excalibur is some magical sword that is going to prophesy the king to come one day to make everything great. Understanding the urgency of appointing a new king, Merlin went to the Archbishop of Canterbury and convinced him to send all the lords of the realm and their warriors to London, where he claimed they would bear witness to a great miracle, a miracle that would surely determine the next king. Right? So... This, this, this sword, Excalibur, is stuck in a rock. There in a churchyard appeared a great marble stone, and there within the stone appeared to be a sword buried within. And there written on the sword were the words, Whoso pulleth out this sword of this stone and anvil is rightwise king, born of all England. And since the prophecy was told um, by Merlin, of a prophesied a great king that would come one day eventually take this sword and be able to remove it from the rock. So Merlin goes and says, hey, anybody that want to try out to pull this doggone sword out of the rock, let's come do it because whoever get it out is the king. Upon reading the inscribed text, we are told that many attempted to yank the sword from the stone, thus signifying themselves as king, but none were able to move it an inch. Evidently, the next king was not amongst those present, and so the Archbishop decreed that any man from the land may try their luck, and encouraged men from far and wide to come and claim their kingship, should they be the one. So people come from far and wide, left and right. And then eventually, somebody, yes, somebody actually does it. Arthur comes in, and he takes the sword right out of the rock. <laughs> Got it. At some point around New Year's Day, shortly after the appearance of the sword in the stone, a jousting tournament was organized for the arrival of the barons and the lords and all their knights, who came to lift the sword from the stone. Amongst these knights was Sir Ector, his son Sir Kay, and his young adopted brother Arthur. Arthur rode into the churchyard and considered the hallowed sword in the stone. But it appeared that Arthur did not know of the significance of the sword, and so, did not know the greatness of his deed when he pulled the sword from the stone. Now that you got this sword, he's like, I'm the king now. I am the king, the mythical king. But there's one problem. 
Nobody believed him. They then head to the Archbishop and tell him of what has transpired. The sword was placed back into the stone, and despite having the sword on hand, it would appear that the Archbishop wished to waste everyone's time and continue on with the charade, as every knight and baron from the tournament made an attempt to retrieve the sword. Nobody's like, yeah, you're not the king. Come on now, we need to see you do the three, four, three, four, five more times. It is only when none of them can move the sword does the Archbishop reveal to them that Arthur has already done this, something which he proceeds to demonstrate in front of everyone, thus signifying him as king. And Arthur had to go prove himself three, four, five more times to do it. But everyone disputed the magnificent feat, for they deemed it a shame that he who had pulled the sword from the stone to become king was nothing but a mere boy. And so it was decreed that the barons would meet again in two months at Candlemas. When that time came, the barons were miffed to find that the result was exactly the same. They could not budge the sword even an inch, but Arthur tore the sword from the stone like pulling a weed from the dirt. When you talk about the myth of the Cleveland Browns, we've all heard about the myths, the, live, the myths of Jim Brown, the greatest to ever do it. Marion Motley, the great Paul Brown, all the titles in the 60s, flagship organization, even down to the plain helmets, which we refuse to put anything on because our tradition, our foundation, our fan base is so strong. We are a pillar of the NFL when it comes to the pedigree of the Cleveland Browns. And every coach, every single coach, grows up hearing these things, right? And what they do, they are actually out here trying to pull the sword out of the rock. You see, if you can, if you can make the Cleveland Browns something, you become the king. You have the people's heart forever. Once you get Excalibur out, you the man. So every coach that comes here comes with the idea that I'm going to be the one to pull this, this sword out of his rock. I'm going to be the one to turn the Cleveland Browns around. Because if I to turn the Cleveland Browns around, I go down in history. That fan base is, will love me forever. I go down in the annals of time. And you know what it does? It corrupts you. You want it to work so bad. And you want it to be about you so much that you'll do whatever you need to do in order to get it. And you lose track of what the goal is. The goal is you want to be in a position where your kingdom is great, not just be known as the guy who pulled the, the sword out of the rock. Because even when you pull the sword out of the rock, you still got to govern. You still have to lead. You still have to go and deal with the poor and the sick and everything else. You got responsibilities now. But people are so short-sighted about that feeling of what if I could get him off the ground? What if I could do this? What if I, at, at Mike Pett, and I'm going to come in and do it my way. Hugh Jackson, quote, I didn't learn how to stop calling plays. Why do you think no coach wants to give up play calling? Play calling, are you ready to uh, announce it now? Yeah, I'm going to call the plays, Jake. Next question goes to Scott Petrick. Uh, why did you make that decision, Kevin? I think with any decision, Scott, we spend a lot of time thinking about what's best for the team. And that's where we landed. Think that, you, don't, you don't think that's kind of a coincidence? Hugh Jackson, I'm not doing it. And if I can assist our offensive coaches, um, you know, Todd, the staff, in any way on offense, because it's something I know and something I think I know how to do pretty well. It's almost like the Lord of the Rings. It drives you crazy. You walk around, precious. I just have to get, I can get my team to do what I need to Clothes, then we will find it and take it for me. For us. Yes, we, we meant for us. And this comes down to the control factor with the Cleveland Browns. You say, come on, G Bush, you got to tie this back in. I thought you lost, you losing this again. I said this a couple weeks ago. The reason why they won't give Nick Chubb the football is because. It's ego. People couldn't understand what did that mean by ego. Usually, kings are always worried about the legit legitimacy of their, of their birthright. You, I want to see the legitimacy of it, right? And if you're a guy who turns around and hands the ball off to a running back, 
your offense is best suited for guys who are journeymen. It's best suited for guys who are out here that need to be managed. Your offense is known as a game manager offense. Your offense is known, well, well, when Nick Chubb goes, we got to find another running back because Kevin Stefanski's offense is all about predicated on a running game, and Nick Chubb put the team on his. What good is being the king if everybody know you're a figurehead? What good is being king when they know, really know that the military has all the punch? And the military is where you get all of your power from. What good is being the king if you ain't the end-all, be-all? You just like the English family. You ain't making no laws, no decisions, nothing. You sitting in a stuffy house with jewels as a maid taking care of guy. Nobody wants to be king. You're king because you want it all, the responsibility, the power, the fame, everything that comes along with it. But guess what? They're looking for something. Just like they told Arthur, we want to see you take the sword out with our own eyes before we respect you. And what they telling Kevin Sosfanski is, we want to see you do it at the highest level without these play action and journeyman quarterbacks. Let's see if you could do it and develop a quarterback. Let's see if you could do it and be Andy Reid. See this? Brett looking, drills the middle, let's go! McNabb throws it, boy they make it look easy, touchdown Philadelphia. What a play, what a throw by Vic, amazing. Alex Smith, and he's got a touchdown, Kansas City! See there's only a couple guys, the true kings, that are able to stand up on top of the mountain when you get good and say, I did this with, or I did this by developing a quarterback, and I did it because I'm the guru. I'm the quarterback whisperer. There it is in a legendary career. They played tremendous football, and hats off to Andy Reid and his coaching staff. One more thing that whoever the Chiefs play has to defend Alex Smith. He is in for the touchdown. The biggest play of this game so far. Mahomes, he's going to try to get there on his own. Showtime. I'm the dude that got Patrick Mahomes. See, this goes so crazy, right? Andy Reid goes down in history because he said, I did it with Donovan McNabb, and I went and got Patrick Mahomes. I drafted him. I saw he was good, and I turned him into somebody that's cold. And my offense is prolific. Sean McVay, offense is prolific. I'm a quarterback whisperer. I turn any quarterback great. And to do that, what you got to have? A predominantly passing attack. It all makes sense. It all makes sense. Because people don't really want to win at all costs. They want to win when it benefits them. They want to win on their own terms. That's why so many coaches fail in this league. So many coaches get muddied down into the years of my way or the highway, trying to tell people, trying to, trying to fool people into making them think there's something they're not because they want that clout. That's why they deflect in these press conferences. They never give you no real, no real questions. They never give you no real answers. As a matter of fact, they've managed it and they've done it so well that these guys don't say anything. So why we keep asking them questions? How do you keep your guys after a loss like that engaged? How do you keep your, your team locked in still going forward um, when that was such a big missed opportunity for you yeah. guys? You know, it's just simply put, the same way we did when we were 2-6. and six. The devil is in the details. And the details show one thing. Every single coach that comes into Berea is the same. They're all looking to be king. They all heard of the storied franchise. They all heard of the magic that will happen and how great they'll be loved and adored and if you turn one of the greatest franchises beyond from, from the back in the day into your project, your situation, your pet. And that's why they all come and they all flame out eventually because it's only so long you can pretend. It's only so, so long that people are going to say, 
let's just go ahead and just give them a little bit of time. You know, you'd never know that we were, you know, whether it's nine and two or two and nine, you'd never know the difference. Give them some time, G. Bush. For the second straight week, you guys didn't have any points in the second half. Do you see defenses doing something different to stop you guys in the second half? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't see a dramatic shift um, in the approach from, from Kansas City. You could have gave Hugh Jackson 12 years. Would he be a good coach? This week, I, I didn't see a, a dramatic shift uh, last week. Maybe one or two things. Um, you know, I thought some of the uh, ideas we had come out of half offensively. Could have gave Mike Patton seven years. Think he'd be a good coach? Uh, could have um, could have produced more than we did. I mean, you know, why do you think it's been such a struggle offensively? I'm going to uh, I'm gonna go back and, and watch this. You could have gave Rod Chizinski three more years. Was that going to help him? In terms of not executing uh, the little uh, run the right route, did Absolutely. we just simply make a bad throw? Everybody did the right thing. We didn't execute it. No, because you were who you were when you got there. We didn't make a bad throw. Uh, we need to add. There, there's, there was five receivers in the route, so we got we got to do a better job. Everybody can call up a play. Everybody can script some play. Where the rubber meets the road is, are you a motivator? Are you an inspiration? Can you get an emote? And can you have guys that not only want to take accountability, but they actually want the responsibility? Because when you need a play, you need 11 guys on the field that say, hey, coach, I'm responsible. I'm going to get you that play. When you empower and motivate your players, you turn over your authority, authority to them. And you say, look, it's not about me. This is your team. You guys and that name on that front of that jersey and the colors of these jerseys will outlive everybody, including the owner. This team will go on forever when we in the graves. You on borrowed time. We are guests right here paying our little respects to an organization that's going to be here forever. So you got to you got to ask yourself one question. What do you want your time here to, what do you want your time served to be like? Do you want people to look back fondly on you and say they were responsible for get, for carrying the torch. They were responsible for making sure that everybody was accountable. They you give you give the authority back to the players because ultimately you let them know legacy matters for some things. Character matters for some things. I learned one of the hardest lessons I've ever learned in my life. You can have talent and you can have charisma and you can have money and you can have fame and friends. But the one person you cannot fool is you. When you look in that mirror at night, do you know if you're a good father? When you look in that mirror at night, do you know if you're a good husband? And when you look in that mirror at night, do you know? You know whether or not you gave it 100% at work today. You know whether or not you cheating your people. And so when it's all said and done and you land on your deathbed and you're sitting there and your family's around you, are you going to be able to close your eyes and say, Lord, I did all I, I, I could do. I left it all out there in life. I loved hard. I gave hard. I played hard. I respected people. And I worked to my greatest ability that, that you gave me. And that's what it's about. That's what responsibility is. As always, it's your boy G. Bush. I'm just trying to give you food for thought. As always, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. We drop it. We drop knowledge. We kick it. And this is something. Share this with people. Because I think this is poignant. The things that you're going through right now with the Browns have always been going through like this. But it's up to us to hold people accountable. It's up to us to put the, the feet to the fire, so to speak. And so we can get to where we all want to go. And that's to host that trophy, trophy and, and get to that parade. You never know where G. Bush might pull up on you. But they always say, you know where you can find me? Just listen for the Clippers.